continuing our series on the Lord's Prayer. And last week, Michael uh, started strong with the first part of it, Our Father Who Arts in Heaven. And this week, we are going to talk about the holiness of God. Matthew chapter 6, verse 9. Actually, I'm going to read verse, yeah, I'm going to read the whole verse 9 because I just can't read that part alone. This then is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. The word hallowed, you may have seen it in Halloween. I'm not going to discuss Halloween this morning. Hallowed simply means holy. And when you hear the word holy, depending on your religious upbringing, that can have a positive or a negative connotation. Because in too many circles within the church, holy means legalism, or what I like to call performative Christianity. It's where we say all of the the Christian-sounding things. We talk about how we've memorized all of the key verses in Scripture. Our faces look like they've been baptized in lemon juice, and we're not nice to anyone. And that kind of self-righteousness pushes people away. That is not holy. Holy is not avoiding wearing makeup. It is not gender specific. It is not wearing clothing all the way down to the floor or covering your head or wearing a suit 24-7. You wish to do those things, that's your business. But we can't call that holy, not by the way God describes or defines holiness. Holiness is about the hallowedness, the otherness of God that he is majestic, there is glory and weight to who he is and is like no other being. Now, when Jesus, before he even goes into how the disciples should pray, I don't have these on a slide, but verses, um, the first two verses of chapter 6, I want to read those because there's something I want to point out there that I didn't even think about um, until a few days ago. Jesus said, be careful not to practice your righteousness in front of others to be seen by them. If you do this, you will have no reward from your Father in heaven. So when you give to the needy, do not announce it with trumpets as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and on the streets to be honored by others. If you have a Bible that you own or you have the Bible app and you're just reading off of it, I want you to highlight a couple of phrases. In verse 1, Underline or highlight the three words, to be seen. The Greek word for to be seen is theothene. And when you look at the word in its transliterated form, it looks like theater. That's where we get our word theater from. And we all know what happens at theaters, right? We're seeing a show. Oh, but it gets better in verse 2. Because Jesus calls the people who are playing to the crowd when they pray hypocrites. Now, in our modern context, a hypocrite is simply someone who says one thing and does something else. And they're normally very public about it. But hypocrite is also a very technical term. It actually has its roots in ancient Greek theater. And what it refers to is acting. So when they would do these uh, old um, ancient Greek tragedies, the actors would actually have masks in their hands and they would have to hold them up in front of their faces. So you were hypocriting if you had a mask in front of you as you read your lines or performed your lines. You were an actor. So when you put the Athenai and hypocrite together, you see what Jesus is telling the disciples he does not want 
in their prayer life. He does not want a show. He doesn't want play acting. He doesn't want us to be anything other than who we are called to be. I don't know who it was, but this pastor said that God will only bless you when you are the you he's called you to be. He will never bless the you you pretend to be. And that is so true. Have you ever been in a room with someone and you're trying to have a conversation with them and you're not connecting? It's like the words are just kind of bouncing off of one another or off of the person and nothing is happening. There seems to be no connection because you might be talking to someone who is not really authentic. They may not actually be the person you think they are. And you're trying to connect and you can't because somewhere, someone is not being their authentic selves. So when Jesus says, I don't want to show the prayer, then he gives us this model. And we're going to focus on this point. When we pray that prayer, that line, this specific line, hallowed be your name. That is an invitation to transformation by God's presence and his spirit. We are asking God. We're not just telling God he's holy, which he is and we should. But this line is actually an invitation to be transformed. And I can think of no better example than that in Isaiah chapter 6. So if you will go all the way back to the Old Testament, to Isaiah chapter 6, And I'm only going to read the first eight verses for our purposes today. Just the first eight verses. Isaiah chapter 6. I love preaching my favorite books in the Bible. And this particular passage deals with the, the prophetic call of Isaiah. Now keep in mind that in the, the uh, five previous chapters, Isaiah has been prophesying to his people that it's time to get right before God. We need to repent. This is what's happening in the land. These are the things that God hates. It's hurting your relationship with him. And if we don't fix it, we're going to invite the judgment of God. Then we get, in this sixth chapter, what you would expect to get in the first chapter. You get this encounter that Isaiah has with God. And so we'll pick up in the first verse. In the year the king Uzziah died, and this is Isaiah speaking, I saw the Lord high and exalted. Some translations say lifted up, seated on a throne. And the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him were seraphim, each with six wings. With two wings they covered their faces. With two they covered their feet. And with two they were flying. And they were calling to one another. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. At the sound of their voices, the doorposts and the threshold shook, and the temple was filled with smoke. I cannot imagine what it's like to be in an atmosphere where the manifest presence of God, the glory of God, comes down and fills up every single molecule of space. I can't even wrap my mind around it, but this is what we do know from the text, that God's glory, God's presence was so strong that the only thing they could cry out was holy, 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 no show. Because now everyone is focused on God himself. 
which is where true worship always begins. It is never on the show. It is never on what we are doing. But it is always on who he is. Now for Isaiah, two things happened to him. Look at verse 6. Excuse me, verse 5. Woe to me, I cried. I am ruined, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips. And my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. When you have an encounter with God, you are going to have to confront who you are not. Have you ever gone to a dinner party or to a function and you were woefully underdressed? You thought you would just dress any old way. And when you get there, everyone is dressed, not just in their Sunday best, but it's formal. We're talking gowns. We're talking tuxedos. And you go in in sweats. Not that there's anything wrong with that because I have a whole collection of those at home. But if you're going to see the President of the United States or you're going to see a foreign dignitary, you're not going in your sweats, right? You are going to be dressed for the occasion. Isaiah is not dressed for the occasion because he recognizes that even though he's been prophesying all this time and serving God, that he has uncleanness. He has to confront his own sin, his own shortcomings. But not only does he have to deal with his own stuff, he has to recognize where he lives. He he looks at it and he says, this is in my community too. It's me, it's us. What made that come to mind for him was that he came into direct contact and encounter with the holiness of God, which is pure. And in him there is no darkness. That, for Isaiah, was a point of inflection moment. And he recognized, I need something. This this can't stay the way it is. Because this holy God Because of who he is, it's as if he's holding up a mirror and saying, are you like me? Do I see you in me like this? And God, being who he is, it's not just enough to say, oh, I I had an experience with God. No, 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 no. Because remember that the holiness of God is an invitation to change and to transformation. God doesn't leave Isaiah there. It's not the end of the story. Look at what happens in the next verse. Then one of the seraphim flew to me with a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with tongs from the altar. With it he touched my mouth and said, See, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away, and your sin is atoned for. The holiness of God, and this is where you see legalism, versus the holiness, the real holiness of God. Legalism says, you bad people, you're sinners. Look at me. You should follow my, look at me. I am the standard. You didn't do that quite the way I thought you should. That prayer wasn't long enough. How many times a week do you fast? How many times a day do you pray? And then the other people walk away feeling guilty and defeated because they're not living up to a human standard. That doesn't, legalism doesn't bring transformation, it actually brings condemnation and more chains, more bondage. But the holiness of God brings healing and restoration, it brings deliverance from sin, it brings purging. And we are being made more like God. 
in this moment, you see the grace of God showing up in his holiness because God is a relational God. God does not simply want us to sit in church and recite great theological truths about who he is. He is holy, but he also wants us to experience that holiness in such a way that we desire to be more and more like him. That we recognize who we are and where we are so that we understand exactly how much we need him. Because one of the worst things to do is to live a life in such a way that we believe that we only need a certain part of God on a certain day around certain people. Well, I need God's strength today, but you don't need it tomorrow? Well, I'm going to need it next week for this big job interview I had, but, but you didn't need it yesterday? God's presence and power are available for us. God's holiness is available to us. We enter into prayer and we recognize the God that we're praying to is a God who is holy, who is inviting us into that relationship where his holiness pervades who we are and it transforms us day by day, step by step, us being conformed to the image of his son. R.C. Sproul, um, a great reformed um, scholar, passed away a few years ago, wrote uh, an amazing book called The Holiness of God. And this is a quote from it. He says, when we are in the presence of God, we are humbled and become most aware of ourselves as creatures. This is the opposite of Satan's original temptation. You shall be as gods. If you notice with Isaiah, the, the passage starts with in the year King Uzziah died. Isaiah was King Uzziah's right hand. Some scholars said that they were actually even cousins. They had some, that somehow they were actually related, familially. But Isaiah worked close with the king, and you know how it is. You work with someone very closely. It's like that person is your right-hand man or your right-hand woman, okay? And then all of a sudden, that earthly king is gone. You remember what happened with Joshua when Moses died? I can only imagine how the wheels were spinning inside of his head and heart because the person that he had served with and served alongside for so many decades was gone. But God wasn't. And that's what God is showing him here. God's holiness kept and changed Isaiah. In fact, with the earthly king out of the way, it is now here where Isaiah says, I saw the Lord. I now see the Lord. And he sees the Lord in a way that we don't see him seeing the Lord in the first five chapters of this book. Now, why does this matter? When we pray, Prayer for some of us can be very difficult because we've been taught that we come with our script, we say what we need to say, and then that's it. But the God we serve is holy. He's, Jesus says, hallowed be your name, that we recognize that when we go to the Father in prayer, that he's holy. And yet, Jesus is telling us, accept this invitation to speak to, to connect with this God. Our Father wants us to know that, yes, I am holy. Yes, I am like no other being or person you will ever come into contact with. And yet, I, as your Father and your Creator, I want to commune with you. I don't want a show. I don't want you coming to me with masks on. Like we come to church with masks on sometimes. 
masks get in the way because no one can see the real you. God already knows who we are and what's happening in our hearts. But he wants us to be cognitively aware of what we're doing so that we can humble ourselves and drop the masks. You don't have to pray in King James. You, do, you are not the bard, it's okay. He just wants you. And how do we hallow God's name? God, God is already holy. And he doesn't need anyone to tell him who he is. God was holy before we were even formed in the image of God on earth, not before the foundations of the, of the world. Before we ever took form here, he was already holy. But how do we hallow the name of God, of this God, this Father we pray to? We hallow the name of God by reflecting the holiness of the Father. The holiness of God must be evident among the people of God. That's the message that God, excuse me, that Isaiah had to preach and prophesy to Judah in Jerusalem in his time. And that's what Jesus is seeking in his time. And that's what the religious leaders at the beginning of chapter 6, Matthew, were not doing. They had their masks, they had their costumes, they had their show. And Jesus was having none of it. You won't be like that. You will pray like this. We are called to reflect the holiness of God. We're not telling God he's holy and then leaving it at that. We can also tell God he's holy by how we live. Holiness and sanctification go hand in hand. In John chapter 17, which I encourage you to read, Jesus talks about the word that he has placed, that he has given us, that that word sanctifies us, that we are sanctified in the truth, that we are set apart, that we are other than we are different. We live in a culture today that has a problem with discomfort. I'm sorry, let me take that back. Uncomfortable conversations. We don't want to get into any of that because then that we have to tiptoe and do the eggshell thing and all of that. We don't want to stand out. That's funny because God calls us to stand out. That when we are hallowing the name of God, we will stand out because God is not like the world. When we are being like our Father, we will be that royal priesthood of believers a peculiar people who are different, who when we walk in, people who do not follow Christ will be uncomfortable. And that's not your problem. If you're just saying good morning, and all of a sudden someone's like, Ugh, it's not you, sweetheart. It's the Jesus in you. In fact, Jesus even says, I do believe in John chapter 7, he said, listen, they're coming after you. It's not you they hate. It's me they hate. It's me they don't understand. But no one will ever have the pleasure of being made uncomfortable by, a, by the presence of a holy God in us if we are doing everything we can to not hallow his name in the way we live, in the conversations we have, in the things we watch on television and online, in the stuff we listen to and entertain. God's holiness, he lives inside of us. We are the tabernacles of God. That presence that, that he built a tabernacle for in the book of Exodus. That same God, that same holy God lives in me and 
you if you are a follower of Jesus Christ. That is the presence that the devil hates. And we must be aware of that. But we must be mindful that God works powerfully through authentic faith. This is not you, everything is perfect and you never stumble. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about a b- believers whose heart's purpose are to pursue hard after Jesus Christ. Because you become what you chase after. Chase after money, you become greedy. Chase after chicks and guys, and well, I'm not going to go there. Chase after, you already know. Okay? You become what you chase after. And God wants to know from New Life Community Church, what are you chasing after today? What is sanctifying you? Is it me? Or is it something else other than me? When we pray, we are praying to our maker. We are praying to our Father in heaven who lives inside of us and who, because he's so good, wants to have relationship with us. Prayer is not an in, merely an intellectual exercise. It is a matter of the heart. The religious leaders had every single part of the Torah and the law memorized. And yet some of them were lost. Why? Because they had it up here and ready to use it as a weapon against people, but they never allowed the truth of God's word to change them and to make them more like the holy God they said they knew. That's hypocrisis, as the Greek word says. That is play acting. So when you pray, take off the masks. Take off the, okay, Lord, let me, I have to, re, I have to re- confess and repent every single thing before I start praying. Come, no, run to him wherever you are. You don't need, need to be here. You could be in your car. You could be in your work shed. You could be at, on the job. Some of the strongest prayers I've ever prayed were in my classroom. <laughs> because God, he knows us inside out. He hears our heart. Our hearts cry when his spirit lives inside of us is to be like him, but the other things, the things that he's brought us out of, the things that he's continually bringing us out of and taking those things off of our lives, those things can pull us back. They can hold us down. And God wants none of that. He called us to be free and set apart and sanctified by his truth, not our own and not the world's. So when we pray, Let us pray with the mindset that God is inviting us to be daily transformed by his presence, by his, the sanctifying truth of his word and his character, so that we are more and more like him. This world is getting darker. I don't know if anyone's noticed it. And I am not a parachute Christian. I am not, I'll be very, very clear. I am not waiting for the rapture to be rescued out. Bye, guys. Ah, and I'm gone. That's not, that's not where I'm coming from. I like a faith that fights. We stand our ground and we be the people of God that we're called to be. And we be the people of God who are connected to our Father in heaven. And we receive from him what we need to receive from him. We hear from him. 
what we need to hear from him so that we can be who he's called us to be. Because the kingdom of God is here on this planet for purpose and for reason, and Jesus has already given us our marching papers. Amen? Let's pray. Gracious and almighty God, Lord, we thank you that there is no other like you, that you are holy, that you are righteous. Father, I pray right now in the name of Jesus that you would quench our desires for anything that you know will kill our relationship with you, kill our relationship with other people, Father. I pray that you would purify our desires, our motives, O God, that our hearts would be fixed on what, what you want, not what we want, but what you want, that we would be able to hear you, that we could stand in your grace and stand in your presence, Lord, and be the holy people that you have called us to be. We thank you, Lord, that as your son said, that you have sanctified us by your truth, the truth of your word and the truth of who your son is and what he did. Thank you that the Holy Spirit lives inside of each believer who empowers us to live the life you died to give us. So may we daily die to ourselves, pick up our crosses, and follow hard after you as you make us more and more like your son daily. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.